In the last video of this chapter, let's talk about the tests of goodness of fit for normal distribution. Since normal distribution is continuous, we must modify the way the categories are defined and how the expected frequencies are computed. Let's look at one example of that. Chemline has approximately 400 new employees annually for its four plants located throughout the United States. An aptitude test is given to new employees. The personnel director asks whether a normal distribution applies for the population of test scores. If such a distribution can be used, the distribution would be helpful in evaluating specific test scores, that is, scores in the upper 20%, lower 40%, and so on and so forth. Hence, we want to test the null hypothesis that the population of test scores have a normal distribution. Of course, the alternative hypothesis will be that the population of test scores does not have a normal distribution. Okay, let's get right to it. First of all, let's import chi-square functions and normal distribution functions from SciPy stats. And in this example, I'm going to import NumPy as well for convenience. You're going to see that immediately. Next, let's load the data. In our case, we have 50 sample test scores. I store them in a NumPy array named score. Once we have that, we can call the methods mean and std for NumPy array to find out about the sample mean and the sample standard deviation immediately. Let's call the sample mean x bar and sample standard deviation s. When we are calling the std method of a NumPy array, because this is a sample, we want to make sure we get the correct degree of freedom. In NumPy, we are going to set ddof to be 1. As a result, we get a sample standard deviation. Let's take a look. The x bar is 68.42. That means on average, the test score is about 68.42 points, and the standard deviation is 10.41 points. Now, let's officially formulate the hypothesis. The null hypothesis is the population of test scores has a normal distribution with mean 68.42 and standard deviation of 10.41. The alternative hypothesis is the population of test scores does not have a normal distribution with mean 68.42 and standard deviation of 10.41. Next, we are going to establish categories. Recall that normal distribution is continuous. We have to use a different procedure for determining the categories. We need to define the categories in terms of intervals of test scores. Recall that the rule of thumb for the expected frequency of at least 5 in each interval category, we define the categories of test scores such that the expected frequencies will be at least 5 for each category. With the sample size of 50, one way to do that is to divide the normal distribution into 10 equal probability intervals. Let's do that in IPython. I'm creating a list named beans. In this list, I'm going to keep 11 values, which are the lower and upper bound of those 10 equal probability intervals. The first value is negative infinity. And then we're using a for loop to find other upper and lower bounds. Within the for loop, this gives us the percentile. And based on a given percentile, we can compute the standard z-score. And once we have the z-score from the standardized normal distribution, we can convert that into the bound associated with our own normal distribution. In our case, the mean is supposed to be 68.42, and 
and the standard deviation is 10.41. Once we have that, we can print out the lower and upper bound for those different percentiles. Let's take a look. In a standard normal distribution, the 10th percentile will be negative 1.2816, and in our case, that is going to be 55.0738, and so on and so forth. As a result, the lower bound for the first 10th percentile will be negative, and the upper bound will be 55.0738. And similarly, for the next 10% interval, the lower bound will be 55.0738, and the upper bound will be 59.6553, and so on and so forth. And in the end, for the last 10 percentage point interval, the lower bound will be 81.7662, and upper bound will be positive infinity. Now, let's go find the observed and expected frequencies. This time, I'm using only one list instead of two lists for both observed and expected frequencies. Each element in this list of frequency is a tuple. The first element of this tuple is the observed frequency, and the second element is the expected frequency. To find the observed frequencies, we simply compare each of those 50 test scores with the lower and upper bound of each of the 10 intervals. If it is greater than the lower bound, but less than the upper bound, and then we count this number to be one of the test scores in this interval. And we do the same thing for all the 50 numbers. As a result, we get the observed frequency. The expected frequency is all the same because this is equal probability interval. So in each interval, we are supposed to have 50 times 10%, which gives us five numbers. Let's take a look at the final counts. Not surprisingly, all the expected frequencies are five, and the observed frequencies are five, five, seven, eight, two, five, two, five, five, six. And next, we are going to compute the chi-square test statistic. Once again, we use list comprehension to compute the chi-square test statistic, and then once again, we assume the significance level is 5%. In this case, the degree of freedom is equal to 7, which is equal to the number of intervals minus 3. We have a total of 10 intervals, but why minus 3? Because we lose 3 degrees of freedom. One for sample mean, one for sample standard deviation, and the last degree of freedom we lose is because once we know the nine intervals, automatically we know the last one or the tenth one. As a result, the degree of freedom is equal to the number of intervals or categories minus three, which gives us seven. And similarly, this is going to be a upper tailed test. So we're going to calculate p-value just like this. Let's take a look at the final result. Chi-square test statistic is equal to 6.4, and the critical chi-square value is 14.067. The resulting p-value is 49%. So the conclusion is obvious. We cannot reject the null hypothesis. So we conclude that, indeed, the test scores have a normal distribution. Here are some quick comments on this example. The numbers we have here are slightly different from those in the book because of the rounding errors. Our numbers actually over here are more accurate. The 30th percentile over here is 62.96, whereas in the book it is 63. 0.01, and this rounding error leads to the counts of 
7 and 8 in the third and fourth interval. On the other hand, in the book, those two counts are 9 and 6 respectively. So that's why the numbers over here are a bit different, but in the end, the conclusion remains the same. Let's look at a summary for normal probability distribution goodness of fit test to conclude this video. Well, first of all, the hypothesis. Now, hypothesis is that the population has a normal distribution. The alternative hypothesis is the population does not have a normal distribution. To select a random sample, we follow the following steps. A. Compute the sample mean and sample standard deviation. And B. Define k intervals of values so that the expected frequency is at least 5 for each interval. Using equal probability intervals is a pretty good approach. And C. Record the observed frequency of data values in each interval defined. And then we can compute the expected number of occurrences in each of the intervals. This is another advantage of using equal probability intervals, because all the expected frequencies will be equal. And then we can compute the test statistic just like how we did it before. In the end, once we find out about the critical value or p-value, we can draw our conclusions accordingly.